Hello everyone. I am, as you've just heard, Dr. Alan Craig. Um, some of you may have encountered me at Leeds as the PEARS lecturer in Israel and Middle East Studies. Um, others may have encountered me as the chair of the European Association of Israel Studies, which is a fantastic organization that provides support for the um, academics and young academics working in the field. Um, but uh, enough of that. What's been very impressive so far today, I think, is the very professional way in which the panels have been run. They've been fascinating, interesting, and running to time. And I actually do think that perhaps some of the, the more interesting and challenging aspects um, take place during the question and answer. And the question and answer so far has been really good. So I am um, putting my panelists on a bit of a warning that I will cut them short because I do want to give you guys the opportunity to engage with this directly in that way. Um, and with that in mind, I'm going to make very short introductions. You've got the biographies in front of you. Um, we're going to be starting off with um, Professor David Newman, who many of you will know because of his distinguished career in academia in Israel, and particularly at Ben-Gurion University. Um, we're following with um, Dr. Hirshhorn, who is currently residing at Oxford and who is saying lots of interesting things currently about settlers and the Israeli right. Um, we following up with Ilham Shabari. Ilham is in the final stages of her PhD research at Bradford. She comes from the, she wants, she's an Arab citizen of Israel and she's going to be talking to us really in the same way as I think all of our speakers on this panel are going to be talking to us, is about identity issues. Israel society, as we all know, is all about identity issues. And I think if we can in any way match the quality that's gone so far, we're all going to be delighted, and I'm sure we will. So without further ado, if we can hand over to David. Okay, thanks very much, Alan. I will keep myself definitely within 20 minutes, and, uh, and I'll speak fast. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, Israeli Professor Bengal University with a good North London accent. Excuse me, David, I think we're working to 15 minutes. Oh, are we? Okay. So, oh, well, I'll cut one of these things out. Okay. I want to think with you a bit outside the box. I, I'm not really a scholar of contemporary Israeli society. I'm part of contemporary Israeli society, but I work, as some of you know, more on the issue of borders and geopolitics, and actually we're engaged in an interesting project now on looking at the geopolitical change in the wider Middle East and what's going to happen with Iraq, Iraq, Syria, the Kurds and their borders and territorial issues. Um, I want to think with you slightly beyond the box and think, okay, 50 years since day war, this is the big theme of virtually all the conferences that are taking place this year, political conferences, academic conferences, um, and uh, what can we sort of think of in terms of that 50 years and think on uh, beyond the present. So in very stark contrast to the previous session, I'm not talking about history or what did or didn't happen or who said what to who um, during the period of the Six-Day War immediately preceding the Six-Day War. I want to make two very important comments to begin with. And that is to say, many of us who are either live in the Middle East or who uh, work on the area of the uh, Israel-Palestine, Arab-Israel conflict, whatever you want to call it, I think we go around a great deal with, the co with warped conceptions of time in our heads. And uh, we have this sort of conception that says, well, 48, 49, 48, the State of Israel was established, the war was the war, UN partition resolution preceded it, and whatever came out of it came out of it, and that was and, that was and has been accepted until today, even though the lines were armistice lines and not fully fledged international boundaries, we sort of uh, accept this conception that everything that happened from 48 to 67 was legitimate, was acceptable, and therefore permanent. And everything that's happened since 67, because this was a war where Israel went into the territories and it conquered, it occupied, it captured, again, whatever term pleases you most, um, and that somehow everything since 67 has been temporary and it's been transient, as though tomorrow we're going to make a peace resolution and everything can go back to the default stage of what was in 67. We go back to the stage where permanence ended and where temporary life started. And of course, the real world doesn't work in that way. The real world works in the way we've gone through a period of time nearly three times as long since 67 
as we, as we or those of us, uh, I, I wasn't in Israel yet in 67, um, and uh, as, those, uh, as though, you know, we can go back to a certain point in time, take a historical picture of what was and what wasn't in 67, and that's where we start from again, if and when there is some sort of conflict resolution, let's not even call it a peace agreement at this stage. And I think we have to change those conceptions because lots of things have happened since 67, which depending on which side of the political spectrum you're on, you may find more moral, less moral, less ethical, more ethical, just, who are the victims, who aren't the victims, but th so many things have happened in, or in 50 long years that those things are as permanent, if not more permanent, than things that happened in the 20 years before. And so one of the points we have to do is we have to start changing our conceptions of time and realize that if and when we were ever to get back around that negotiation table, which doesn't seem very uh, possible at the moment, um, we, we, you know, conflict resolution deals with the reality of today um, and with all the um, uh, compromises, mutual compromises that have to be made, it doesn't go back to some sort of historical date, however just or less just that may be. I think that's one important point we have to think of 50 years down the road. Uh, the other point we have to also think about in 50 years down the road is that over 70% of today's Israeli population were born after the Six-Day War. Um, uh, well over 50% of Israeli's population were born after Israel's Long Lebanon War, which started in 1982. My students and uh, many of your students at Israeli universities who are older students than British students, they're in their late 20s, their early 30s, they were born into a very different reality. I mean, I remember the Six-Day War. I was 11, not 9 at the time. I remember being in a Jewish day school here in London at the time and what a major event it was. Um, and how many of us, is there anyone uh, in the room who was around when the State of Israel was established? If there are, then they were a very young person at that time. And the sort of messages that we sometimes use about besieged, isolated um, Israel, which were the messages of the 50s and the 60s leading up to the Six-Day War, yes, young adults in Israel who are very involved in the conflict, who serve in the army, who then go to university and create families and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, are involved in economic life, they're very conscious of the problems of the conflict, of the threats of the conflict, whichever way they're looking at it from, but they were born into a very, very different Israel. They weren't born into a besieged Israel, not into an isolated Israel. For them, the Holocaust is very important history, but it's history. It's not something they experienced, and in many cases, it's not even something their parents experienced. It may even be third generation, and therefore, they're looking at Israel. These are today and tomorrow's leaders. Um, and many of them are already in that area, and some of them are getting into it now. And their starting point of thinking about Israel and its borders and where it should be in the global location is very different from, I think, a lot of the writing and the, even the continuation of the traditional writing and the messages that we think about, um, which are still emanating from the 50s and 60s and the period leading up to the Six-Day War, rather than the period which is 50 years, 30, 40, 50 years after the Six-Day War. And I think that one of those messages that, and then this is more of an impressionist, personalized comment than a professional comment, I think we need to change is that we have to recognize and accept that uh, Israel is a strong state, both militarily and economically, and the world sees us as a strong state. Yes, there are threats there. There are threats from immediately threats from rockets and from Islamic fundamentalism from the wider region. Um, but at the same time, Israel is a strong state, and I think we do ourselves an injustice when we still try to sell the message of saying, look how besieged and isolated we are, the only small Jewish state surrounded by a whole sea of, of you know, 20 or 21 Arab states, and we don't sort of recognize where, um, uh, where we really are in the global scene. And that point is very important is because I think in conflict resolution, it needs to be the stronger states, uh, or it always has to be the stronger states that take the initiative and put the issues on the, on the table, that they lead the way. And I think that we have a problem in Israel that we tend to respond to initiatives, often when it's too late, when uh, having put forward in it, then maybe the same sort of initiatives 5, 10, 15 years earlier, there would have been greater chance of them succeeding some way down the way. So I think that first big point I want to make is that the passing of time, we need to think differently of where exactly we are in today's regional scene and in today's uh, global scene. That's the first major point I want to make. Second point I want to make does touch on some of the work I've done. I'll say something very briefly about settlements, but I don't want to tread on Sarah's toes, who's going to speak about settlements. But back in the 80s, my first published work was all about Kushemunim and the early settlement movement and about borders 
uh, which I work on very closely today. And, and that is to say that uh, since 67, the politic body of Israel has changed. There's no question about it, which explains why the settlement movement after 50 years has, let's not talk about East Jerusalem, let's leave that outside the equation for the moment, but even leaving that outside, there are plus minus 400,000 settlers or Jewish residents of the West Bank, or again, whatever you want to uh, call them, which was something when I was working on the topic back in the 70s and the 80s, the beginning of the settlement movement, everybody said, ah, you know, these are just a few crazy radicals, they'll pass. In, 19, uh, in the early 80s, there was a plan called the Droblis Plan to bring 100,000 settlers to the West Bank. By the year 2000, everybody laughed at them and said, you haven't got a chance of doing that. And by their own initiatives and with the help of all Israeli governments, left wing and right wing alike, because there's never really been a freeze of settlement at any time uh, during that 50 years. So they've reached now 400,000 and the number is growing. Um, uh, particularly as the borders become blurred and not everybody realizes exactly which side of the old border they're, uh, they're, they're, they're living on, except for people who are ideologically opposed to living on the other side of the line, so they'll check it out. But otherwise, and that number is growing, and that is a form of permanence. As I said, it doesn't make it more just or less just, but it creates a situation which makes it very difficult uh, for conflict resolution. Uh, when we use this very glib phrase where we say settlements are an obstacle to peace, well, you know, but when the Oslo agreements were signed in the 1990s, you may remember some of you, there was a leader of the settlement movement who came along, Israel Harel, and said, we succeeded in squatting in the land, but not squatting in the hearts of the people of Israel. Therefore, we've lost our dream of a greater Israel. Um, and at the time, they felt they'd lost the dream of, you know, pursuing annexation of all of the territories of all of the West Bank. But there's no question, those of us who have worked on borders in all sorts of contexts in the last 20, 30 years, in track two, in, in other workshops, there's no question that settlements have made it extremely difficult, almost impossible, to draw borders, to draw clean borders, to the extent that many of us who have been very supportive of the two-state solution, there are those who are ideologically opposed to it, both from the right and both from the left, for different reasons, of course. But those of us who have been very supportive of it have come to a, a situation today where we say, we still believe it in principle, but we believe the opportunity has missed us. We've missed the opportunity because it's almost impossible today to draw those clean borders, and we have to think beyond the territorial box, and we have to think, are there ways of power sharing um, which don't require um, clean lines and which maybe uh, uh, can uh, have some sort of crossover citizenship including all of the Arab-stroke Palestinians and Israeli-stroke Jews living within the whole of that territory between the Mediterranean River and the Jordan River. And I say that, 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 that with sadness because not talking about borders does me out of business to a certain extent. But even so, we have to think beyond the territorial box today because of the amount of time that's passed and, and the permanence of the temporary period that has uh, set in. And that brings me to a very important point, and that is to say that, of course, today in Israel we have a government which you would label, if I can use a British understatement, as right of centre. Some would say it's the right, most right-wing government that we've had in Israel, certainly with people like Bennett and Lieberman, who are very prominent to politicians. They're trying to change the narrative. Bennett is the first major politician who comes and says, forget about the two-state model, let's go back to previous ideas of even extending sovereignty, of annexing the territory. That was never heard under any right-wing government in the past 20 or 30 years. We have a Minister of Justice who's very significantly changing the composition of the Supreme Court. And yet, at the same time, there is still the right-wing narrative which says, oh, look at the left-wing, they're the hegemonic people in Israel. They control the media and they control the universities and they control the narrative. And what I would say is one of the most significant changes which has taken place in the 50 years since the Six-Day War is that Israel has gone from being a one-party state to a one-party state. Only 50 years ago, it was one party of the left, and today it's one party of the right. The left wing have not won a significant election in Israel for I don't know how many years, and, um, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I say it from a personal rather than a professional perspective, it's not going to happen, uh, but it's certainly not in the next five years, maybe even longer than that. And today, there's no question that the control of state and its political messages, which include messages relating to the Arab-Israel conflict, has gone very significantly from left of center to right of center, and that has been both a direct and indirect um, impact of 50 years of the Six-Day War, because the right came to prominence, really, in the period after the Six-Day War, with settlements, with the rise of Begin, and with everything that's happened 
si uh, since that time. If I talk about younger leadership and younger generations, then I think I should uh, sort of um, also conclude with saying something about the very young people in Israel. As part of a big consortium that I was uh, just finished five years of one of these big EU FP7 projects where we looked at the changing significances and implications of borders, um, we, um, e each of the 21 universities involved in this project, I was in a sense the Israeli part of the consortium with Ben Gurion University, um, each of the 21 were asked to create or produce a small video um, trying to show what, does, what do borders mean to, ya to people in each of these societies and countries. And we did something um, which was quite out of the ordinary, and we managed, after getting a lot of permission, because a lot of ethics involved in this sort of research and so on, we managed to, well, we looked at what is the impact of the separation, wall, fence, barrier, again, whichever term you like, um, which has been constructed over the last 10, 12 years um, around, in and around parts of the West Bank. And part of the video interviews 8 to 12-year-old children, Israelis, who are therefore settlers in Kirat Arba, Palestinians who live in Hebron, in Hebron, and we ask them to depict what's on the other side of the wall, the wall that they don't cross outside their windows. And I must admit, very depressingly, they both had totally mirror images of the other side. Number one, it showed, by the way, what impact walls still have, even in a global society, when you think that everything is diffused through internet and through the web. But nevertheless, what you don't meet tangibly and physically outside your front door is invisible. If it's invisible, you have a lack of knowledge. And if you have a lack of knowledge, you fear what's on the other side, not necessarily a physical threat. Um, and unfortunately, these kids who are 9, 10 years old, who therefore have only ever known the separation barrier, have a complete mirror image of the other side. And I don't need to tell you that, that image of the other side is that they're all dreadful, they're all monsters. Um, uh, uh, if it's on one side, they're terrorists. If it's on the other side, they're people who bring tanks into your bank garden. And it says something, I would say, very depressingly about what we may expect as these people grow up into the next generation of leaders 10 or 15 or 20 years down the road. And my final comment, because I have to say something about borders, is to come and say that obviously the conception of borders has changed since the Six-Day War. Yes, we've spent a lot of the last 20 years trying to draw borders, but we forget that their functions and significances have changed in a very considerable way. Borders do not provide security. They may prevent an individual terrorist coming in or going out, and that's something, yes, but they do not provide security in the way they used to. We know that already from 1991, when missiles came in from Iraq, from hundreds of miles away into Israel. But today, if you're living in the north of Gaza or in the south of Lebanon, if you're part of Hamas or Hezbollah, and you can get onto the internet and find out how to make a, a small uh, rocket uh, on the internet, and you make it in your kitchen, and you go outside and you fire it from your rocket, uh, from your shoulder, and it doesn't have any particular direction, but could it easily hit a kindergarten in Steyrot or a university in Beersheba, it's an experience I know about, um, then, of course, borders don't stop those sort of things happening. And we have to ask ourselves uh, not only the question about how difficult it is to draw borders today, but what do we need borders for? What significances do they have? They do have many other significances and importances. They determine your territory as opposed to the other person's territory. They determine belonging. They determine identity. But they no longer provide that essential element of security with which we have traditionally associated borders in the past. Thank you. So I fear that David has occupied some of my territory on this panel, so I, will, I hope we will try not to duplicate too much, but um, I was asked to speak a bit about settlements, which I will do. Um, so there's little doubt that the establishment and the exponential growth of the Israeli settler movement over the past five decades is one of the most significant and controversial historical developments, not only in the history of Zionism and the state of Israel, but in the region and international politics. It has dramatically shaped Israel's territorial reach, its strategic environment, the religious secular divide, political parties and voting behavior, extra parliamentary activity, economic expansion, population distribution, and the social and cultural spheres within Israel or internally, not to say the least about the lives and the future of Palestinians and the Arab world. 
Moreover, the settler movement has made both Israel's existence and its policies more polarizing than ever before, with important consequences for its relationship with the Jewish diaspora and the non-Jewish international community. Today, Israeli settlements are commonly suggested, if not as the sole obstacle to peace, but one of the five final, final status issues that have prevented um, a conclusion of a, a uh, durable and just um, final status agreement between Israelis and Palestinians, and has been blamed for the collapse of the Oslo process and the continuing cycle of violence in Israel-Palestine. As the two-state solution hangs in the balance of history, the spotlight remains focused on its future. Yet for all the popular discussion in the media, and sometimes amongst academics, little is really known about the historical development of the Israeli settler prize and the evolution of its ideologies, constituencies, and discourses over the past five decades since the 1967 war. There's little discussion about the heterogeneity and dynamism of the Israeli settler camp and its broader base of ultranationalist support, nor about the vast changes that it has undergone over the past half century. Moreover, because much of the popular discourse is tainted by political polemic, it often makes it hard to understand the project from a more scholarly or neutral perspective. Um, you know, we can argue about whether that's valuable. Um, I also, in other guises, I also wear more of the hat of an activist, but today as an historian, um, I really want to speak about, um, you know, what the past has to offer in making an informed prediction about its future. Um, so again, I want to talk not only about the exponential growth of the settlements and the settler camp itself, but also the broader base of ultranationalist support that has grown over the past five decades. First, to go back to the 1967 war, in the last panel we discussed um, in the questions and answers about you know, the possibility of plans that were in the drawer for um, the military occupation um, of uh, the territories after the 1967 war, but suffice to say that the settler movement itself wasn't necessarily planned beforehand. Certainly an occupation of the Palestinians may have been, but um, very much this was something that came about um, in the euphoric aftermath of the 1967 war. And I go back to Tom Sege's book on 1967, where he told two jokes about uh, the 1967 war. The first is the, you know, the crisis of confidence within the Israeli, uh, Israeli public about you know, the last person, last Israeli that leaves Israel should turn off the light at Lod Airport followed by the second kind of um, euphoric uh, um, expression of Israeli imperialism that, you know, we've conquered Cairo, what will we do after lunch? And this was very much the atmosphere in, in which the settlements took root. Um, also, we should remember that the settl settler enterprise was also influenced by the Khartoum Conference in the, in the fall of 1967, where the three no's and uh, expressed about the future of, an is of uh, Arab-Israeli peace, also um, had an impact on the thinking of the Israeli leadership. But today when we talk about um, the accidental empire that, uh, that arose in the summer and fall of 1967, we can say that certainly while, there, while the Knesset and government leaders debated and dithered throughout the summer of 1967 about what to do with the newly occupied territories, events on the ground quickly overtook them. Now, despite the fact that there was really limited um, settlement in the occupied territories in the interwar period between 1967 and 1973, um, after the 1973 war, both for strategic and economic imperatives, um, settlement took off. But um, for the first decade of settlement, we're certainly talking about um, an evolution from a small ideological national religious vanguard inspired by messianic ideals to live in the whole of the land of Israel, to a largely strategic suburbanization that happened in the 1980s, where the growth of settlements grow from less than, you know, seven, less than 8,000 individuals to over 100,000 in less than a decade. And certainly by Oslo, um, this had grown even further, and the little and perhaps dirty secret of the Rabin administration was that settlement growth was, you know, was the largest under his administration than any other prime minister in Israeli history. Um, now, the strategic suburbanization also, you know, changed the constituencies within the Israeli settler movement from that of an ideological fringe to um, the, um, you know, to the heart of uh, Israeli society. Today, the two largest constituencies within the Israeli settler camp are Haridim. Um, over 100,000 live in two major cities um, in the West Bank, and primarily economic settlers who are, as, as we've said about the blurring of borders, 
are vaguely aware of where they are um, and supportive of what they're doing, but are there mostly for tax incentives, bigger houses and a nice garden than because they want to really be on the front lines of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, the number of ideological settlers that were obviously the majority in the early days of the settler movement has declined dramatically. I would place them maybe around 15% of the movement, and they're clustered um, in various enclaves that are known for um, you know, uh, their uh, firebrand rhetoric and often violent settler terrorism activity. We can talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A. Um, but certainly because the population of settlers has changed dramatically, mostly due to the kind of settlers that, that um, are, are settling in the occupied territories, this has correspondingly changed both the ideological um, and strategic outlook of the settlements. And, and, um, and we certainly see a kind of plurality of visions about the end game of the Israeli-Palestinian Israeli conflict evolving because of this. And I should also say that as the settler camp itself changes, and we're still, you know, depending on numbers, we're talking about somewhere between 400,000 and 550,000 settlers, depends whether you count, um, you know, the areas that are next to the municipality of Jerusalem, which the Israeli government considers part of Israel. The international community clearly does not consider areas over the Green Line part of Israel. Um, but correspondingly, um, the, the base for ultranationalist support has changed. You know, settlers alone do not determine parliamentary politics, despite the rise of Habayit Ayyub, the Jewish Home, and other far right-wing parties, and even its penetration within the Likud party. And um, you know, people who are supporting the settlers are the same people who are sitting in cafes in Tel Aviv, sipping their cafe hafuch, um, that are not necessarily interested in living in the settlements themselves, but support either a strategic or uh, broader vision for holding the territories. Um, and are not only supporting them at the voting booth, but also at the checkpoint in the occupied territory serving on military duty. So to keep in mind that despite the fact that the settler camp you know, certainly punches above its weight both uh, in parliamentary and extra parliamentary activity, this whole enterprise could not be sustained without the ongoing encouragement and support from a much larger base. Ehud Sprinzak, a, a scholar of the Israeli ultranationalist movement who sadly died in, early in his career, um, wrote about the iceberg phenomenon of Israeli extremism, describing the Israeli, center, Israeli settlement enterprise as you know, a block of ice floating, floating in a sea, and what you see above the surface of the water is, is, is the settler camp, you know, the kippah suruga, the knitted kippah of the, of the religious nationalist settler. But underneath the surface of the water is the much larger base within Israeli society that comes from many different streams and lives in many different regions within territorial Israel that is keeping, that is keeping this entire block of ice um, afloat and sustained. So to, keep, so to think about how this has grown, as David had said, that we've moved from a one-party system of the left to a one-party system of the right, is primarily this much larger base that doesn't live in the settlements and you know, maybe doesn't even share and certainly doesn't necessarily share in the religious outlook of some of the vanguard of Israeli settlers that is on sustaining this enterprise. And, and is also not only you know, encouraging the exponential growth of the settler movement, but is also either you know, tacitly endorsing or turning a blind eye to the growth of illegalism and settler terrorism. And so as we move into you know, the, the debates today about the future of the two-state solution, I think we could clearly see in that UN vote in December that the consensus over settlements um, has largely uh, changed. Um, there do seem to be new winds coming from the Trump administration, which remains to be seen what will, what will, what will come of that. Um, to borrow from uh, Guy's shameless plug for his book, um, I also have a book coming out in May um, about um, American Jews and the Israeli settler movement, which touches on some of this nexus between um, those in the Trump administration and American Israeli settlers in the occupied territories, of which there are over 60,000. Um, but you know, as we look to the future, um, the two-state solution looks, you know, like it's more increasingly consigned to the dustbin of history, and the question of what kind of alternatives could follow from it. Um, obviously, there is, you know, a one-state solution. As David said, the left and the right are converging on this point, although have very different visions of what that one state might look like. Confederal solutions, though moving from a system that is based on land for peace and the value of land, which is, you know, so essential to 
uh, Palestinian ideology, if not also to right-wing Israeli ideology, um, to that of power sharing seems a little bit um, implausible given, uh, given the environment in Israel-Palestine. You know, this isn't, this isn't Belgium. It's hard for me to see things working out that way. And of course, the discourse that's lately um, you know, become popular in certain circles and becoming increasingly um, articulated even by what I would consider the center in Israel, like Yitzhak Herzog, about some version of unilateral annexation, if, if part, if not all, of the West Bank, with or without citizenship for the Palestinian population. Um, it certainly remains to be seen what, what, will, um, what the Trump administration um, will um, you know, pursue in this regard. Yesterday, the news came that he had been meeting with the Yesha Council, the umbrella organization of the over 150 settlements in the occupied territories, which perhaps uh, implies a shift in um, its support for the two-state solution. Um, and I think there much remains to be seen, but it's certainly that, you know, if we look at the past, there's been a dramatic over evolution over the past five decades. And, um, you know, I don't think it would have been very easy to predict um, the, the, you know, revolution that the Israeli settler movement has caused in Israeli society, but it certainly is something that can't be undone if settlers themselves, you know, settlers themselves perhaps um, you know, some, some number of them might, you know, might either be forced or be willing to evacuate, but certainly the revolution that this has caused within um, the Israeli body politic really can't be undone, you know, either today or maybe even 50 years from now. Thank you. Hi. Um. Thank you for having me here today. It's an honor really to, to present and it's a bit intimidating to talk after such a brilliant professors. Um, as uh, Professor Ellen, uh, Ellen introduced me, my name is Ilham. Uh, I'm coming from Israel. I'm Arab citizen of Israel and I'm a third year PhD candidate at Bradford University. Uh, my research is looking at the area of the relationship between uh, the Arab community in Israel and international bodies such as the United Nations and uh, the European Union. Um, and today I will uh, shed light um, uh, and focus about the internationalization process as uh, sort uh, kind of trend that w has been developed in the, ra the last uh, two de uh, decades, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so I want, first of all, to start with talking about uh, linking the Arab community to the Six Day War. First of all, the first thing that came in the literature is uh, the process of Palestinization. So uh, I will be talking about the process of uh, the Palestinization versus Israelization. Uh, but first of all, I will be giving you a background about the demographic shift and the political representation of this community in Israel, and then to link uh, the, it to the Six Day War and its implications. The Arabs in Israel who managed to survive the war that, uh, that surrounded the creation of Israel in 1948 was about 1,050,000 50,000 people. This is small minority has doubled itself almost 10 times. Today in Israel, there are one and a half million Arab citizens. The vast majority of them are uh, Muslims, Sunni Muslims. There are two groups, uh, small groups, uh, Christian Arabs and Druze Arabs who make up about 10% uh, each group. And uh, the most interesting thing about this minority that the vast majority of them, over 80%, identify themselves as Palestinian in the first place, then as Arab, and then as citizens of Israel. If, you look, if, you, if we are looking at the uh, period before the 1967, uh, I, I research uh, the historical documents that the Arabs were sending to international bodies uh, during the military government to ask international help, um, you hardly will find the word Palestinian in any historical uh, uh, document that they were uh, sending to international bodies. The word Arab was strongly uh, appear, uh, appears in their, uh, t in, or used in the terminology. They were influenced strongly by the pan-Arabism notion by, uh, inspired by Jabal Abdel Nasser, and even there was a, a, a movement, a nationalist movement called Al-Ard, Al 
the land, which uh, eventually was outlawed uh, due to its uh, radical views. But the key point here that the word Palestinian, they hardly uh, see themselves or define, identify themselves as Palestinian. Uh, this uh, radical shift or uh, dramatic shift uh, in their demography uh, was seen by the Israeli government as a demographic threat. Benjamin Netanyahu described uh, this uh, uh, increasing uh, in their demography in 2003. He said, uh, quote him, Israel's growing demographic problems, not because Palestinians, but uh, of Israeli Arabs. Now, uh, another, uh, another turning point in the, historical, uh, in the history of the Arabs in Israel was in 2015, when in the first time uh, in their uh, political history, they created the Arab Joint List. In fact, uh, and then they changed the name to the Joint List as it including uh, one uh, Jewish member of the Knesset, Dr. Dov Hamin. And they managed to achieve 13 seats, uh, the highest number of seats that they managed to achieve uh, since uh, their political uh, uh, participation in the Knesset. Uh, this party is the third uh, largest party in the Knesset and the second largest uh, party in the opposition. The interesting thing about the Arab community that in the last election, their participation uh, in the election was about uh, more than 60%. Uh, and uh, according to the last national surveys, uh, they, uh, over 60% of them, they are in favor of joining the Israeli uh, coalition, the government uh, coalition. And uh, it's worth noting here that since the creation of Israel, no Arab parties has joined the Israeli government. And it's leading, it's leading me here to the uh, main point that uh, occurred after this 1967, which is the, the Palestinization issue. Now, the Palestinization issue started after the, uh, the Green Line was erased as a result of capturing the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So, and also it was uh, at the same period when the Israeli government uh, and its military government uh, over this population. So suddenly they had access to Palestinians who are living in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And for the first time, they started to see themselves as part of the wider Palestinian community. They started to acknowledge that they are not only Arabs, not only citizens of Israel who were granted citizenship, but also they are part of the Palestinian people. Uh, Many of the Israeli Jews uh, see that there is a huge contradiction between being, uh, between having Israeli citizenship and being Arab citizens of Israel and at the same time identify them yourself as Palestinian. Uh, and for, Palestin for Arab citizens of Israel, it's, uh, it's, it's, this combination can work and uh, uh, but the question is how, what would, how it would affect the relations as the national surveys show that over 60% of the Israeli Jews believe that an Arab who defines himself as Palestinian Arab in Israel, he can't be loyal to the state and to its laws. So this contradiction really put the question of the Arab-Jewish relation really in threat, uh, in my opinion, and need uh, to be uh, addressed. By the years after the Six-Day War, uh, the Arabs, uh, the number of the uh, Arabs who started to, Arabs in Israel, I mean, who started to gain high education was uh, dramatically increased, and uh, in the during the 1970s, they started to uh, build their political institutions, and uh, their national awareness about their Palestinian situation, their Palestinian background, and uh, also developing uh, developing of human rights in that period, especially the minority rights. 
um, they were very uh, aware about uh, these international developments in the international law in the human rights area. So they started to use the language of human rights and to ask the state of Israel not only to be equal citizen, but also to be recognized as a national minority and as indigenous people indeed of the state. Uh, these demands were uh, came first uh, in uh, during the years 2000 and two th 2006 and 2007 um, during the vision documents. Uh, this vision, uh, these documents were seen by the state as a process of radicalization of the, the Arab minority of Israel because they strongly, they made uh, their statement very clear about the Jewishness uh, nature of the state. They said as that Arabs in Israel will never be treated equally as long as Israel continues to define itself itself as a Jewish and Zionist state. And therefore they start, they ask uh, for the first time in their history, they were outspoken and very assertive about their demand uh, from the state to uh, abolish the Jewishness in nature. And they started to uh, suggest uh, different formulas such as a state for all its citizens and uh, et cetera. To give you a bit of sense about uh, how uh, the development, how strong was the, the uh, influence or the implication of the Six Day War on the identity of the Arabs in Israel, I, I, brought, I copied here two quotations from two letters that were sent to the international uh, community about the situation of the Arab citizens in Israel. The first letter was sent by uh, the head of the joint list, uh, Ayman Ode, uh, just in 2016, in the last year, uh, regarding the situation of the Bedouin community in the Negev. And so, sorry, I have to look there. He wrote, uh, it appears in the uh, right side of the slide. He sent it to uh, Ban Kimon. He wrote, I write to you as son of the Arab Palestinian national minority in Israel. We Arab Palestinians living in Israel are native to the land and citizens of the state, are part of the Palestinian people and the Arab nation and cultural sphere and the human one. Then in the end of his letter, he asked him to, uh, uh, he called, he called for international support. He said, I would like to ask you to dispatch a fact-finding mission to the Negev to examine the dire situation, situation of the land's indigenous people, Arab population, and work to secure their rights, etc." So here is one illustration just about the language uh, and uh, how they stress their Palestinian identity the same Palestinian element that didn't exist before the exposure to Palestinians and to also to the Arab world as a result of the Six Day War. Another example, and I think it's a very powerful example, Arabs in Israel for the, time, uh, for the first time in history, uh, they created the International Day Support or solidar Solidarity uh, for Arab Palestinians in Israel. So far, there is uh, one day uh, that is recognized by the United Nations uh, for the so that called for the solidarity with the people, with the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. But this time, for the first time in history, Arabs in Israel uh, decision, uh, took decision to uh, distinguish their struggle uh, in the international community and to tell the people, the world, that there is uh, a Palestinian community within Israel which is not called Israeli Arabs or Arab citizens of Israel. They are Palestinians. They are citizens of Israel. And they ask the world to support them, to put exert pressure on the Israeli government to treat them equally. So here you can see also quotation of, it was organized by and uh, initiated by the follow-up committee of the, for the Arab citizens of Israel. And as you can see al also the language uh, he started his uh, letter by Palestinians in Israel, at the same time, a component of Palestinian people and Israeli citizens. 
the follow-up committee initiated, initiated on January 2016, the first international day for supporting the rights of Palestinian citizens of Israel. We believe international solidarity will, with our struggle to confront the state's discriminatory policies is vital. We urge you both to express your deep concerns to the Israeli government about this repressive anti-democratic trend and to call upon the state reviews its policies in light of international standards. So again, the language of uh, human rights language, the use of international law, and uh, the use also of the internationalization as a dip uh, diplomatic card used by Israeli Arabs uh, politicians and also combined by NGOs and extra parliamentary organization. And um, to end, but just I want to finish my presentation by saying that uh, this minority has been marginalized and uh, situated on the periphery of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as Israel considers the, its Arab minority as a pure internal Israeli affair. And um, the, Arab in, the Arabs in Israel are strongly convinced that they are not internal affair. They are, their situation, their problematic position or political status in Israel is uh, uh, negatively uh, influenced because of the wider Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Therefore, they are now trying uh, to put themselves on the, uh, on the peace negotiation agenda and uh, to be, uh, and ask for uh, also solution for them. That's it, thank you so much. Okay, thank you if we can just reconvene. Thank you to all our speakers. Um, what I want to do is I want to collect a um, small number of questions um, for the panel, and then we'll see how many rounds we can get in. So if we start from one over here, you want to give us your question? Uh, hi. Uh, oh, thank you. I, I think you know who I am. Um, it's a question to uh, David and Sarah. Uh, first, an observation. We know that uh, most of the settlers in the West Bank, they live in the outskirts. 90% uh, of them live in the outskirts of the West Bank. Uh, those settlers that we hear about in the news and that are a cause of friction between the IDF and the Palestinians, only 40,000. Every geographer, urban geographer, that looks at the map, uh, he's saying basically they're a flop. They didn't succeed in, in settling I in the depth of the West Bank, and all those settlements are deeply dependent on government subsidies. So aren't we a little bit premature in burying the two-state solution? Okay, can we have that question? If we can bring the mic to the front row, please. It's rather a comment than, than a question, and it will relate directly to what uh, Ilham and Sarah uh, just presented. If you can identify yourself. Oh, uh, uh, my name is Nidal Fukaha. Uh, I'm the director of the Palestinian Peace Coalition. Uh, I came from Ramallah, and I don't know, probably I'm the only Palestinian in addition to uh, Ilham here in this hall. Uh, we know uh, this, this spirit... Uh, within the Israeli political institution, spirit of discrimination, uh, anti-Palestinian uh, Arabs, in, uh, Palestinians inside Israel, who Israel preferred during the last 60 years or 70 years even to call as Arabs. And then it is still existing actually uh, when it comes to dealing with the Palestinians who are living in the Palestinian territories in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Within this, just a, a couple of comments. Uh, just last month, Israel evacuated the settlement of Amona, and they dealt in a such a way, which I myself, I experienced, I it happened that I have to go to Jerusalem at that day. And I noticed by my own eye how soft the Israeli security are dealing with the, with the settlers of Amona. Imagine uh, the whole center of the West Bank between Jerusalem and Tel Nablus, almost it was a type of curfew for the Palestinians. However, 
Compared to a situation in Umm Al-Hiran, in, in um Al it was completely different, non-comparable at all. And just uh, a couple of days after the evacuation of Amona, just in order to balance the mood within Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu informed the cabinet that our forces are operating in Kalansui. Kalansui is a village inside Israel where Israel put down some Palestinian homes. This is not the story. The story actually is just last week, an Israeli Knesset member, uh, I think Mickey Zohar, he talked about this issue of uh, the one state in the way he understands it, but it is probably the status quo reality. Well, he said that uh, Israel will annex uh, the whole area and all people will have uh, all the rights, Palestinians will enjoy all the rights with a small, just a small exception. It will be a very small exception. And they will not have the right to vote or to be part of this democratic system. So imagine this is the only exception which the Palestinians will be deprived from, from but for the rest, you know, they will be equal citizens with the Israelis. So this is what I wanted to add actually to what Ilham just presented. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just a last comment from anxious questioner over here. Hello, Alexander Matthews from the FCO, though I asked the question to David very much as an individual. Um, so when I was studying law, I very much focused on jurisdiction, which means I was fascinated by your speech and could listen to people talk about borders all day. One of the things you mentioned was talking of the social and moral changes that have happened over the years. While studying law, I was always amazed at the conflict between lawyers and politicians and how they would literally just draw lines in the sand against the way that individuals on the ground would view borders and how it was far more based on their learned experiences and their views of history, often contradictory. Go, go and see the film Viceroy's House. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so whilst I think neither history nor politics on their own could either solve the conflict, one of the problems we have is they're often in contradiction with each other, these straight lines drawn in the sand against views of history that are often conflictory from different groups. How can we try and marry these two groups together so that we can get a, probably a better and more realistic approach to building borders? Okay, so can I ask the panel to reply fairly briefly to these questions because I'm detecting um, an interest in the room in a significantly larger number of questions also. So, Sarah, yeah. want to start? Um, sure, I guess I'll start with... Uh, with yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll start with... Uh, Guy's comment. Um, I mean, look, we're, there's there's two you know there's two layers of analysis here. One is are there technical solutions, you know, to the settlements question in a final status agreement? Yes, there are. Lots of smart people in this room, amongst many other rooms, have been involved in crafting these you know ways of dividing up the land. You know, three or four settlement blocks. Some of you know are considered consensus settlements, like Gushet, the Gush Etzion region of the West Bank outside of Jerusalem. The REL block is more problematic because you know of the nature of the configuration of the block. This is the sort of the, the quote unquote knife in the back of uh, the future of Palestinian state. Um, the expansion of settlements into various areas where they did not exist in the 1990s. So it's not necessarily possible to roll out the technical blueprint that you know we had on their desk in Washington, D.C. in 1993 to you know 2017. But yes, there are technical solutions to the problems. And the number of settlers that are, you know, I think that we would consider those that would, you know, most violently resist um, a future evacuation are relatively small, though we should remember that a third of the IDF officer corps today comes from, you know, has grown up in a settlement. The larger base of Israel, the Israeli population is not necessarily inclined to, um, you know, boot settlers out of their homes that they've been living in for, you know, 30, 40 years, some of them. Um, and, you know, and I don't think that there even, you know, really are, um, you know, I, I think that even if there are, there is a willingness to do that, there's also these questions about some, you know, very hardcore ideological sentiments, what, you know, what would be required to evacuate those settlers and will they have to be left in place or some other solution reached for them. So yes, there are technical solutions, but then I think we have to get to the level of, um, you know, of discourse and about, um, you know, history that, you know, I, I just don't, you know, I don't think that there's um, buy-in for partition today. I'm not sure there ever was buy-in for partition other than that, you know, very brief period in time between, say, 1993 and the year 2000, um, really on both sides. 
Um, you know, Palestinians' record since 1937 is that they have rejected partition. That's not the, their vision of a Palestinian state is between the river and the sea. And I don't say that as some kind of value judgment on the Palestinians. I'm saying that that's how they ideologically perceive where the state of Palestine is. And they don't necessarily see a state of Palestine um, you know, either on this idea that it would be, you know, in the maximal offer on something like 92% of the West Bank, and certainly not under a condition where Israel will annex almost, you know, all of Area C and leave a Palestinian state on something like 40% of the West Bank. So I think that that, you know, is a no-go. And the Israeli population, um, you know, and Israeli leadership has fluctuated over time about its attitudes towards a two-state solution. You know, I don't need to tell you that Ben-Gurion had his own ambivalences about what the border should be in an ideal world. But, you know, certainly o over time, the drive towards a vision of Israel, which also lies between the river and the sea, has captivated a larger and larger percentage of the population. So when I look at surveys that the Tammy Steinmetz Center at Tel Aviv University conducts every month and it asks both sides, do you want a two-state solution, i.e., do you want partition of the land, because that's really what a two-state solution is. Um, and the answer, you know, is, is um, you know, increasingly no. At the height of the Oslo Accord, something like 85% of both populations wanted that. Um, we can talk about who didn't want it and then the fact that those, those constituencies will always exist as peace process spoilers. But over time, the numbers have declined and every month, the numbers are, um, you know, the, the numbers get smaller and smaller and smaller, and we're getting, you know, closer and closer and closer to the point where, you know, 50%, you know, 55%, 60%, it depends what's happening in the news, but, you know, less, far less, um, you know, of, you know, a plurality of both populations want uh, partition. I'm finishing up. Um, so that is to say that, you know, what happens on the day where the Tammy Steinman Center says that only 49% of Palestinians or 47% of Israelis want that solution? Can you still sell that solution as, as the durable, just, and claims-ending agreement to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? I don't think so. So there's real urgency that if there's going to be a two-state solution, um, you know, it's going to have to come sooner rather than later. But, you know, I should also say that I don't see settlements as the sole obstacle to peace. So even if you have the technical solutions and the, you know, discursive buy-in to this idea in terms of the borders related to settlements, you've got a whole bunch of other problems to, to solve that um, I frankly don't think can be um, resolved in a, you know, durable, just, or claims-ending way under the rubric of a two-state solution. And that's not because I don't like it. I wish that I, I, that would be my preferable solution to the conflict. You can. I mean, uh, part of the problem of the Arabs in Israel is that um, they all the time were claiming that the state uh, is uh, treating them as an enemy. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, after uh, the our commission uh, documents, um, admitting this thing that the um, Israeli uh, police during October, the events of October 2000, was uh, uh, treating the uh, protests of the Arab citizens of Israel as if they were uh, enemies of the state and not uh, civilian uh, protests. So um, in many ways, uh, this issue, that, like the, the I, I also forgot to mention something in my presentation regarding uh, the Israelization process that was simultaneously uh, curing uh, uh, in parallel to the Palestinization issue. Uh, and n it doesn't matter how much the Arabs in Israel, according all the surveys, they want to be integrate. They want to be integral part of Israel. They are uh, willing to be part of the Israeli government in the coalition. Uh, they are in favor of uh, their relating uh, their faith and uh, their future with the future of the state. They are not, uh, uh, in their internal debate, they are not asking uh, about the legitimacy of Israel, which is something uh, that is, I think, unique only to the Arabs in Israel. Uh, among all the Arab uh, uh, people worldwide, and including Palestinians in the other side, and uh, but uh, the state, all, all, all the state, the state, like all, what they are asking is that the state should recognize their uniqueness, and to be sensitive to their uh, uh, uniqueness, to their political status, and uh, maybe once this happens, I mean. Uh, 
both Palestinians and both sides will be in a better position because also uh, their political status, the Arabs um, in Israel, I mean, they can affect uh, negatively any future peace uh, agreement with the Palestinians uh, if this one and a half million citizens uh, will not be uh, satisfied uh, within uh, the future uh, or in any future framework, peace agreement framework. Uh, so I can't see really, um, yeah, any, any chance for real uh, coexistence and harmony between the two people in Israel uh, uh, as long as the state doesn't recognize their status and put them on the agenda. Uh, yeah, that's Thank you. it. David? Okay, uh, three quick I'll start from the end. So I, I will say something about the question concerning Palestinian citizens of Israel, although I'm not a scholar and I don't research into that area at all. But I think the great tragedy of the Palestinian citizens of Israel is that, you know, long in the past you occasionally heard the phrase, oh, we could be the bridge between the Arab world and Israelis. The great tragedy is they're mistrusted by both sides. Mm. Israelis see them as a fifth column, mm. and the Palestinians see them as too much part of Israeli Western society, and therefore they're pushed to the margins from both societies. And all I would say is I think that's their great tragedy. What solutions are to that, I, I don't know. Concerning your question, look, um, I've not said it's impossible. It's increasingly difficult. Um, I personally still see the concept of two states as the best of all the bad solutions to the conflict. As I say, and if Sarah, I mean, I don't follow the peace index every month, but if the numbers are going in that direction, it says something about how people think from the days of the great consensus, you know, 10, 15 years ago when the Gaza was evacuated and so on. I do slightly differ with you. I mean, and there's been so many car ingenious cartographic ideas of how you draw the borders, where you draw the borders, how many you can leave on this side and then have land exchanges, be it in the south or as Lieberman would want in the north with all the, the implications of you know population transfer without transferring anyone physically, et cetera, et cetera. I think the numbers are slightly different to what you say. Um, but regardless of what the numbers are, the geopolitical dilemma is that wherever you draw that line, wherever you draw it, the hardcore ideologues are on the wrong side of the line. The people who are, let's say, in the Beta elite or, or all along there, who, who maybe most or many could potentially move for compensation, wouldn't have to because you've redrawn the borders. The ones that always have to be evacuated in such a scenario are the hardcore ideologues of Gush Emunim, Elon Moresh, Shiloh, Kudumim, Bet El Ofra. I think the numbers are bigger than you, than you say, but again, that depends what map you're looking at. And they're going to draw in huge, huge support from other areas in Israel. So all I'm saying is it, it becomes increasingly difficult for an Israeli government to do that. And forget about right-wing governments. I'm not sure the left-wing government has any idea. But it, it's a bit like a pr uh, um, in England, you've got a government who are committed to Brexit, but they've got no idea how to do it. <laughs> that's quite a good comparison. I think that's what would happen with the left-wing government in Israel as well under that situation. And the final question about uh, borders, oh, I'd love to get, I'd talk for a length on that. I mean... Borders are artificial constructs. There's no such thing as a natural border. And if you look at the history, I mean, 100 years ago when Europe was divided up after First World War, and of course the Middle East, Sykes Pico and San Remo, which has all come apart now, borders are always artificial, uh, artificially constructed, and invariably they're imposed by a stronger side upon a weaker side. If you have a bilateral agreement, um, you have to have two sides who bilaterally agree on borders, and they're equally dissatisfied at the end of the process, because once you say that one side is totally satisfied, it means that the expense of the other side. Dare I say it, I, there was one thing that Trump said in his, uh, um, in his um, p uh, press conference with Netanyahu the other week, which I, I partially agreed with. And he, I mean, uh, please don't accuse me of being pro-Trump, but the, he said one state, two states. He said, whatever you guys you know, on the two sides agree with, the fact that the two guys aren't going to agree to anything in the near future is something else. But there's, a lot, but, but there's a lot of truth in that. But, um, you know, borders to be acceptable have to be bilaterally agreed. Historically, they've always been imposed or have been the outcome of war. And if I can end with one small anecdote on borders and history, Abba Eban, in one of his autobiographies, writes that in the early 50s, um, when he was the young ambassador to both the USA and the United Nations, in his 30s, he was the ambassador to both of these, amazing, he says he came to Ben-Gurion and said, look, we didn't expect 
what happened in 48 to happen. The war ended as it did. You know, give me the green light and I will try and sue for peace with all the Arab countries and make the armistice lines into permanent lines. Uh, the fact they didn't want to speak to him anyway is, is another question. But, but, but according to what Ben Gurion wrote, uh, Abba Eban wrote, he says that Ben Gurion turned around and said, you know what? He says, no, it's not a good idea. He says, armistice lines are something temporary. He says, who knows what's going to happen in the future and they have to shift this way or that way. Maybe he had a prophecy about the Six-Day War. <laughs> but but uh, he said, but once you make them international boundaries, it will be even more difficult for us to change them in the future. And I think there's a lot to think about in that statement. Okay, more questions. Can we have the mic at the front row to start with, um, and then we'll spread back? I think it was Gallio was asking first. Yes, Gallio, go on. I just wanted to add, uh, there was a hint here when you talked about uh, one-third of the officers in the Israeli army today are, are religious, and I think one of the biggest, biggest changes brought about by the Six-Day War was a change in the national religious community inside Israel. Uh, from many, many, many points of view, but I think that's the most significant thing that's happened. A, a, a tremendous change in the character of the national religious community, in their religiosity, in their nationalism, on both sides of the, of the, of the phrase. And all the way up to today where you have the national religious, well, of course, the, the party being Bennett, which has gone way, way, way uh, off into a, the ultra-nationalism. But also the national religious today are everywhere in every institution in Israel, not just the army, every institution, and it's not by accident, I don't want to sort of talk about conspiracies, but it's not an accident. And I think this is one of the most significant uh, results of the Six Day War. Okay. Can we take the mic to the back for the moment? Oh, no, I'll move. My question is to Ilan. First of all, thank you very much. It was absolutely fascinating. And I just wanted to ask you, what do you think is the likelihood of the Palestinian Israelis actually to succeed, especially today when they face, as uh, Galia Golan said, such an ultra-nationalist uh, government, right-wing more than ever, and be to what degree, if you want, the grievances and also the situation of uh, Israeli-Palestinian worsen after 1967 being seen as part of the Palestinians. Can, can you just clarify for the moment? You said what, 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 what are they likely to succeed? Yeah, just, for the purpose front, uh, just, yeah. just for the purpose of the reply. Yeah. Succeed in doing what? Succeed in actually being recognized as a national a minority uh, with a significant demands being discriminated against because if at all, the situation became worse. But they were also always discriminate. They were discriminate even, you know, in, I don't know, 57. And now you face a situation where it's even more right-wing government. Uh, uh, okay, so you, you're raising two things. You're raising one, um, reduced levels of discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. But the others, when we're talking here about an agenda of a national yeah. minority, that's a specific thing also yeah. different from yeah. just discrimination. Last question just over here in this round, if we can take it to the front. Thank you, Mike Gapes, MP. Um, I'm interested if you have any information, I guess this is mainly to Ilham, but it may be to, to the others as well, about the possible developments with regards to the Palestinian uh, political structures and their relationship to Israeli Arabs who identified themselves increasingly, as you discovered, they said, uh, as, as Palestinians and not as Arabs. Can you say something about the political representation, the PLO, and also uh, relationships with Fatah and other groups? Is there um, any way that the Palestine National Council or the Palestinian institutions can, can reflect this diversity? Mm -hmm. Or is it just going to be uh, West Bank and, and, and Gaza and diaspora groups? Okay, thank you for those questions. Um, I'll start, thank you for your questions. Um, I think um, regarding the cooperation or the representation uh, within the Palestinian uh, uh, Authority, um, the, for, for many years uh, there were, I think there were, were even laws in Israel that uh, banned Arabs in Israel to have uh, this kind of relations with Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. But after that, in the last years, 
there is an interesting cooperation between the two sides. I mean, the International Day uh, for the call for uh, international solidar uh, solidarity with the Palestinians in Israel, it was uh, cooperated by the Palestinian Authority. And uh, I think they took budget and they cooperated with Palestinian uh, embassies uh, around the world with the PLO, yeah, uh, and it's, it's also something interesting. I mean, the Israeli government should really take the issue of the Arab minority in Israel really seriously because so far they are still running to the Knesset. They still want to be part of the Israeli society. But the question is, till when? And uh, I, uh, my afraid is my concern as being part of or coming from this background that my community, my leadership will one day will give up, will just uh, give up. They will uh, say that there is no point of keep going and uh, having active part in the uh, Israeli Knesset. In the is we are in the margin of the Israeli political sphere. There is no point of going even in the opposition and having this voice. And, uh, the, the, and I think the, the process, the trend of the internationalization where they are starting like uh, there is sharp increasing of the number of the letters and the calls and the meetings with foreign uh, diplomats and uh, to ask for uh, international support and the cooperation with the Palestinian, uh, the PLO. Uh, there are many signs that showing that uh, Arabs in Israel are starting to look for external channels. Uh, they still, still didn't give up totally. And uh, uh, I did, I conducted interviews with the leader, uh, with the political leaders, Arab political leaders and the po uh, leading NGOs, Arab NGOs who are dealing uh, with international uh, issues. And they all almost agreed that they still didn't give up uh, on the struggle with, uh, within the state. They want to still to negotiate with the state their uh, political status. And uh, they are uh, referring to international and external bodies just to ampl amplify uh, their, uh, their demands. Uh, however, uh, my concern that it will reach to the point that they will give up totally and they will, be, will prefer the path of uh, separatism and nationalism and all these negative awards. Can I address the panel? Can I just say something yeah. about um, the, gr the national religious sector? Um, you know, I, I think that we tend to see this as sort of just these arcane theological debates that don't have any strategic implications, but certainly like the, the 1967 war, you know, caused a, you know, a really fundamental theological reconsideration within the Orthodox camp that even created this category of national religious, which only, you know, existed as sort of a small, um, you know, minority community in the pre-state period. Um, and, and their growth really has had, you know, massive implications, but um, not just sort of their, you know, visibility, I guess, within Israeli institutional culture, but I think that the theological changes have also had strategic impact in the sense of um, changing attitudes towards territorial compromise, to resistance to the IDF, even, you know, suggestions that some doctrinal um, interpretations uh, permitted the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Um, questions about the Temple Mount, which you know had been verboten in traditional Orthodox thinking, even a, even in the decades after the 1967 war, which have now seen a complete reversal. That the national religious camp are the biggest agitators for, you know, return to the Temple Mount, and also these questions of you know something I think that you know is really reasonably new to the discourse about you know the creation of a halachic state or sort of a kind of I guess we would say a, a theocracy in Israel that even in you know even that took several decades after the 1967 war to manifest themselves, um, you know, not only do they sort of have an influence in this way, I think national religious, especially the group that I've studied, American settlers in Israel have had a profound relationship on um, translating these concepts to the international community and converting, you know, scripture to a soundbite or prophecy into public relations. And because they stand at the bridge of what I guess we call today modern orthodoxy, they have a foot in each camp, both the secular and the religious, and they've learned how to mobilize secular discourses to, um, you know, reinterpret religious ideology to make palatable to 
um, an international public. So that I think is quite important. And last but not least, you know, this the theological revolution also had a profound impact in the Jewish diaspora, and that's why we see, you know, um, Orthodox and you know and other support, um, you know, growing for Israel. An attachment that didn't really exist to Israel prior to the 1967 war has blossomed into, you know, um, a, a you know really, uh, um, you know, sustained um, commitment that didn't exist before. I think, I think Sarah presented that very nicely. You know, I come from the national r religious world and. Most of my family, many of my childhood friends are exactly in that world today, so I have a good contact with them. There's no question that uh, they have become tremendously empowered since the Six Day War. Numbers have grown, obviously. Uh, Bennett has empowered them even more because, in terms of playing politics, he's been a very successful political leader. Um, and I think they've been conscious of the fact that sometimes they've been criticized of turning religion into being a land of Israel party. Therefore, it's very important them to show that we can be religious in the universities. We can be religious and do everything regular, unlike the ultra-Orthodox society, of which they're very afraid of, because their demographic growth and their position in the power politics today is also growing, and that's where a very major ideological battle is taking mm -hmm. place. So there's no question that, um, as you say, it's not conspiracy, but there has been a very clear strategic way of thinking, of saying, we have to become more powerful, and I don't think it's any big secret. I, I don't want to say it's not going to happen. After Trump and Brexit, anything can happen in world <laughs> politics. But, um, you know, Bennett sees himself as a potential prime minister of the mm -hmm. state of Israel. And uh, who's going to put money today on Jeremy Corbyn not being the next prime minister? <laughs> I mean, so many I crazy will. things. <laughs> so, being, so many crazy things have happened in world politics in the last year. Um, as a, sorry, can I just say, since Sarah and Guy both sort of did a prime for the book, I haven't got a book to sell. But if you want to see that video we did for the Borders Project, it's, mm. it's freely accessible on YouTube. It's called Peeking Across or Peeking Beyond the Wall. And it's a 40-minute video about how kids in Hebron see the separation barrier today. Careful what you find if you Google that. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, we, we've got time for one quick round of, uh, of either short comment or question. I think, I think actually you had your hand up a minute ago. Yeah, just a, a comment. Uh, one about Ben Gurion and one about uh, the Turkish. Uh, the comment on Ben Gurion is that uh, until 1967, uh, there were endless opportunities for Israel to expand its territory in the West Bank. Uh, and it didn't change even one inch. When Israel did change, the, occupy the West Bank in 1967, the first person to say to give it all back and get the hell out was Ben-Gurion. Uh, as for the settlers, um, you know, I, I don't want to detract from the, the problem that the settlers pose, but there is a very good uh, uh, scholar on, on this subject who I regard as expert number one in Israel on, on the settler movement, that's Shaul Ariely. And Shaul Ariely writes consistently about the weaknesses of the settler movement. The great majority of the increase in numbers over the last few years are Haredim, mm. who are not there for ideological reasons and who don't live deep in the West Bank. Amona was removed and the sky didn't fall in. In fact, the Israeli public, when Amona was removed, was quite apathetic to the whole thing. The, the, the ratings on television were very low. People weren't even watching. So I, we must also, as problematic as the issue is, we mustn't fall into the trap of settler propaganda, which is desperately trying to convince us that the situation is irreversible. It may not be. OK, Nidal, but it needs to be brief. Just I wanted to add a small thing regarding the Palestinian official position vis-a-vis -vis the, pal the Palestinians inside Israel. Uh, the Palestinian official position is for the Palestinians inside Israel to get integrated into the Palestinian, into the Israeli socio-political system. And so for that, they encourage them and they support them. And this is why they don't have any political representation with the Palestinian political system inside Palestine. So their power or their influence should be inside Israel, but not uh, out, uh, in, inside the Palestinian society. Thank you, that's good clarification. Um, brief last comment. I'm gonna hand up at the back over there. Uh, 
Thanks, uh, Ian Black from LSE. I wanted just to come back to what Asher just said. I read some stuff recently by Shaul Ariel. He writes very well, he's very articulate. But like both sides, he plays with the figures in order to bolster his own argument. So the figures that, uh, in my head certainly, the current population, Israelis who live beyond the green line, that includes East Jerusalem, and I think that East Jerusalem is an important part of this. The distinction is very often made, but as everybody knows, that's not accepted internationally. The total current figure from a year or two ago is 630,000 Israelis live beyond the Green Line. That's 10% of the Jewish population of Israel. Now, when Ariely writes about it, he says, no, there's only, in fact, 4%, and the figures for the actual settlements, the land that is occupied by the settlements, is merely 3%. But if you look at the jurisdiction of councils and if you look at military training areas and IDF bases, it's 42% of the West Bank is under Israeli control. So there's, there's a, there's, the arguments are interesting, but people choose the evidence in order to support their own thesis. I'd like just to ask a, a slight follow-up on this to all of you. We've talked heard quite a lot about uh, Naftali Bennett, who's obviously clearly a rising star, an important figure. He is calling quite specifically for the annexation of Area C sometimes, sometimes he talks about Malay Dumin. He's clearly a rising star. We've heard all about the changing political background in Israel. Question, is it conceivable that in the coming years, given the geopolitical background, Trump and everything else, that Bennett could be in government and could go ahead with the annexation, say, of Area C of the West Bank? Could that actually happen? Simple do we, question. Do we have another question before we move on? Any more questions, any more comments? Can't see any on the floor. Okay, well, I, I, I'm reluctant to throw these questions to the panel because these are questions that I think would take another half an hour to answer. Um, certainly the question about whether or not we think Bennett is going to get into power and whether or not he's actually going to bring it off. Um, I, think, uh, I think we're all in the area of speculation there, and I think most people in this room have got an opinion on that, and I'm not sure it's going to be... Um, enormously clarified by our experts at the moment, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. Um, I, the, the last round of questions, I think, are, are very much comments that are, are, are presented in the form of questions, and I don't criticize for that. I think, um, I think the comments that have come from the floor um, following this session have, uh, have been insightful, interesting, and, uh, uh, and answering many issues themselves. So I'm not going to put this round of questions to the panel. I'm going to invite you to show your appreciation for what I think has been a, a, a fascinating, challenging, and interesting session.